Welcome to our very first bonus episode of Romans Untangled. Romans Untangled is normally the podcast where we take a seemingly difficult book of the Bible, that is the book of Romans, and we untangle it so that we can enjoy its beauty. However, this week we're offering our first ever bonus episode. This episode is entitled Truth, Humility, and Homosexuality. I'm Pastor Steve Treichler, Hope Community Church. Glad that you could join us for this. Let me tell you a little bit about how a bonus episode, this is a new thing to me as well, but it's basically a time for those who are interested in a topic to kind of take a little excursus or a little excursion with us as we go a little deeper into some of these issues. And where this came about, if you are just tuning in and you're primarily interested in this issue, let me tell you how it came about. It came about because we were studying Romans chapter 1, and as we look at Romans chapter 1, uh, we were looking at verses 18 uh, to 32. And in Romans 1, 18 to 32, it talks about uh, what is happening that how the gospel is going to be revealed. In, in verses 1, 16 and 17, if you're new to the Bible, you're new to the book of Romans, 1, 16 and 17, the theme verses are given for the book of Romans, and it talks about the good news of the gospel is that the righteousness of God will be revealed from and by faith, from first to last, it says. We get to verse 18, and the Apostle Paul now is going to first tell us about the bad news. And in verses 18 to 32, to recap it very quickly, uh, he, he unpacks here kind of how the wrath of God is being revealed. There is actually uh, godlessness and wickedness, and people suppress the truth of God. And, and even though uh, just by natural abilities that God has given to us from nature, from things that are created, uh, we can see God, but we have chosen to not glorify him, it says in the book of Romans here, uh, or give thanks to him, and our hearts become darkened, and ultimately... The the verse that becomes very important is that we exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and reptiles and animals. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. So what the Apostle Paul here is doing is talking about a couple things. This wrath of God is coming out, and the reason for it is because of this great exchange that we have where we are exchanging the truth about God, and we're exchanging the glory of God, and we're exchanging that for a lie, a lie about God, about what he wants for us, and we serve and we worship other things. Quoted quite well, I'd say the best place in the Bible, in verse 25, where it says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Best definition of sin in the Bible. The next verse then, verses 26 and 27, is where this uh, I, where this bonus podcast came from. Therefore, uh, excuse me, because of this, verse 26, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And it goes on to say, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done, they've become with They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So I, I I encourage you if that if that's a, it intrigues you like what was that about I encourage you to listen to the podcast we have I spent four weeks uh, kind of unpacking this in uh, episodes on on just what what going on kind of the overall passage of it what does it mean this great exchange uh, we talk specifically about the the issue of why does God go after homosexuality here and then the last thing is um, why um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
what's going on with this God's righteous decree in verse 32. So I've spent time doing that. So if, if you're, again, you're just hopping in here, uh, please know that I, 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 want, I deal extensively with those things in other podcasts. But what we've come to the conclusion in those podcasts is why does he choose homosexuality and, the, and the, the, as the sin that he's going to bring up as, as one of them, right? He brings up a lot, but what is one of the big reasons? And it's, the big idea is here, it says this natural for unnatural. And, and the idea there is not, when we think of the word natural, I think of a natural ability. Wow, they have a great golf swing. Isn't that a natural ability? Or they're just a natural speaker or some of those things. That's not what Paul's getting after here. Uh, because I think a lot of people, and, and an argument against this is they're saying, hey, this is saying that if you are heterosexual, that's your natural way. Therefore, if you were to go and to be homosexual, that would be sin because you're operating outside of that, what is natural for you. Now, that makes sense in English, but that's not what the Apostle Paul was getting at here. He's equating the idea of natural with the idea of the creator. So instead of worshiping and serving the creator, which we were created to do, we instead uh, turn inward. We look, instead of looking to God, to to the, the great other than us, uh, we look to self. We look to the creation, to things that 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 who we are, right? And that's exactly why he picks homosexuality, because instead of being the other, we look in on ourselves. And I'll unpack that a little bit more coming on in this episode. But I wanted you to know that we do deal with that. However, now you're thinking, well, we we kind of talked about that. Why then are we doing this special bonus episode? There's a variety of way to talk about things, you know. And I, I would say there's a logical or perhaps even theological way to discuss things that come up in Scripture that are that are very important. And it is important to get that. I'm a big believer in Scripture and that we need to have that understanding of things. And at the same time, there's what I would call either a pastoral or a, hey man, this is where I'm living. How does this truth fit with me in that? You got to speak at my level. That's the aim of this podcast. This one is really trying to speak more to the the, the reality of the matter, the heart of the matter. Um, I've been a professional Christian now for it's going to be thirty four years, and I and I've I've helped a lot of people in a variety of a lot of different contexts with sexual issues. And so I just I, the main point of this is if you're tuning in and you're saying I, I want this guy to convince me he's going to make all this argument to convince me uh, that homosexuality is sin or something that's not exactly where I'm going in this I will do a little bit of interaction with this uh, with that with that issue but but not that's not my main point here I'm not trying to pick a fight I'm actually not trying to convince you of anything uh, what I am trying to do is I'm assuming one of two things. One, you're already a follower of Jesus and you're you're wrestling with this issue for a variety of reasons, uh, maybe personally or you have friendships or, or just maybe you love people and you just want to say, how does this all fit together? You Either that or you are someone who is investigating Christ. And to be honest with you, this is a defeater issue. In other words, this is an issue that I just can't get over. And it's like, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. So therefore, this podcast is for you to just just kind of just sit back and 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 and, and allow the, the things to, to land on you. I, I don't expect you to totally agree with me, um, I, but I, I want to help you and I want to kind of minister to your soul. So realize that's what I'm doing. Now, let me, let me, cloud the issue here before we try to attempt to make it a little bit better. I think there's two ways that we're hearing messages. Think of it like, and I'm old enough to remember when when uh, we used to go around and we'd go to a party or we'd go something and we'd carry a big boombox. Maybe you put that boombox, boombox is a, <laughs> you may not even know what it is, uh, but it was a, it was basically a, 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 a a stereo or whatever that you would you'd hold on your shoulder and it was big and it had a couple speakers and and you know it was way before there was headphones that were cordless and all that kind of thing and it's the way you did music in in public and the boom blocks is just screaming into your ear and I'm going to argue that you have at least two of them there's probably more but at least two of them and here's what they are the first one I would say is whatever your perception of religion is all right and and if you know me well enough to know I'm not a fan of religion you might think 
wait a minute, didn't you just say you're pastor of senior pastor at Hope Community Church? And yes, I am. That's how I make a living. But I'm not a fan of religion because I think religion is basically a system of rules that people have put up to try to make themselves okay with God and make themselves better than other people. And Christianity is not a system of rules, and I'm not any better than anybody. In fact, I, I, I actually think there's a lot of people who don't yet follow Christ who are much better, more moral people than, than I am. So religion is screaming into one ear. What, I'm, what I think is screaming into the other ear is what I would say um, is irreligion or anti-religion or um, you know, make things up in the in your in, in in your culture how it speaks to you. In other words, we don't look to outside sources; we just look to what we as a community say. That's kind of the, those two things, and I think both these things are screaming into our ears. Let's talk about what's screaming to our ear from religion. Religion. If you grew up this way, you might have heard some of these messages. Sex is bad, right? Sex is bad. I think it's the worst possible things to tell kids. Because then they experiment sexually and go, I don't know what you're doing, but this is awesome. So that's you know not helpful. Or it's dirty. Or listen, we have a strict, we don't talk about this rule. Uh, that's kind of the way I grew up. We, we just didn't talk about it. And so therefore, just don't have sex. Just don't do it. And then maybe when you're married, you know, three or four times to have kids, kind of a thing. Um, or you might actually put yourself in a religious mindset and say, uh, you know what? I'm better than other people because I don't struggle with blank sexually, pornography, masturbation, uh, gender confusion. Uh, I don't struggle with homosexuality, or or I, I don't my my orientation or my gender idea is not queer, or or just the, you can go on and on, right? And so you just say, well, I'm better than you because I don't struggle with that. I'm straight, or I'm I'm whatever, right? Or you might worship your purity and say, I don't do, I don't look at porn. I don't, I, 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 I'm not involved in masturbation. I don't think sexual thoughts. I just keep myself pure and I then am pure. Well, that's all religion, folks. And that is not the gospel. Uh, those are not truths of the gospel. What irreligion is screaming to you, and it's screaming very loudly. In America, it's screaming ever loudly since the 1950s and 60s when we had the sexual revolution. And one of the biggest things it's screaming to you is this. It is saying, if you don't express yourself sexually, you're actually not fully human. You're, you're, you're actually lying to yourself. They probably would also be saying to you, what's the big deal? It's just sex. It, it's nothing more than that. And you might have heard the phrase, I have a friend with benefits. In other words, this is a person I just go have sex with. It's, it's not more complicated than that. The flip side of this that you're also hearing is, listen, sex equals intimacy. I, I'm only intimate with people that I have sex. It has to be sexual in order for there to be a real deep sense of connection. And one just recently that has happened ever since 2015, 2016, when the um, Supreme Court ruled that uh, the the marriage of simply heterosexual people is unconstitutional is a couple things, one of which is they would say, well, you're simply on the wrong side of history. In other words, um, you are not for people's civil rights if you have any, any thinking that is opposed to this. Another one that is Becoming more popular, it's been around for a while, but I would say it's becoming more popular since 2016, 2015, 2016, is you're reading your Bible wrong. You, you, you're not actually reading it correctly. You're reading it in the way of the, the old understanding of Christianity, and you're not reading it right now, and so you're really just a fool. You're holding on to antiquated ideas that are actually hurting people, and it's because of a wrong understanding of Scripture. So let me just very briefly go back through what both boom boxes are speaking to you and just kind of offer some, some, maybe some nuance or a bit of a rebuttal to these ideas. First off, what religion is screaming to us, that sex is dirty or sex is bad. No, sex was created by God. Last time I checked, everything God created was good. It can be used for bad things, of course, but if, if you're going to say that things that have been used that harms people or whatever should never be uh, touched well. Don't ever do the Bible because more people have fought and wars have been uh, have been had over over scripture interpretations and there's all kinds of fault with that. So no, sex is not bad and sex is not dirty. 
Uh, the no talk rule is because I, because I think there is some truth to the idea that sex is a very intimate part of who we are. We'll see that even in a brief study we'll do here with scripture in just a moment. But therefore, we don't want to, we don't not just want to talk about sex. We don't want to talk about anything that is really deep to us and personal, things that we're afraid of, things that we have maybe uh, longings for that are outside the bounds of what we even know that we maybe should or, or what we want to be. And we don't, we just simply don't talk about things that we don't want to. It's not just sex. Uh, the idea that I'm okay because I don't struggle with whatever you're struggling with, well, there's a lot of parables in Scripture about that. <laughs> My favorite are the two guys that go up to the temple to pray, and and one guy just says, I thank you that I'm not like this other guy who I give a tenth and I do all this stuff, and I'm not like that slouch. And the other guy just looks to heaven and just, he doesn't even look up to heaven, excuse me, just bows his head and just says, God, forgive me, have mercy on me, I'm just a sinner. And Jesus says that that's the man who goes home justified from the temple to pray, not the other one. If you look down on anyone on planet Earth, anyone, anyone, about anything, you don't really understand the gospel. The gospel is the idea that we are all sinners before God, and by his amazing grace expressed on the cross, we're another person, the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, fully God, fully man, went to the cross on my behalf. And all I can do ever say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just want to let other people know about what he's done. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. That's it. So I can't have that. And worshiping my purity means that somehow I'm better. Somehow I keep points and that's not Christianity. So none of that is Christianity. Now, on the other side of the, the, the equation here where it says, if you didn't express yourself sexually, this is what the, what the irreligion is saying to you. If you don't express yourself sexually, you're not really human. Um, no, my two favorite people in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ, both were single men. They were celibate, single men. So, and I'm pretty sure they were both fully human. So the flip of that is it's just sex. It's just a, it's just a bodily function like going to the bathroom. What's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal because of what, how God has created it, what he's created it for. It actually is created uh, somewhat, not as an end point, but as a means to teach us about intimacy and safety and covenant and extreme love, not just uh, an opportunity to uh, experience a physical release or an orgasm. It's, it's much more than that. The idea that uh, you're on the wrong side of history is very interesting because I would say First off, I'm, I'm actually not in this podcast making a case about public policy. That is another whole bonus episode sometime. We might even do one because of Romans chapter 13. But what do you do about public policy? That's a great question. What I'm actually in this podcast doing is speaking to those who want to look at Scripture and what does Scripture teach about this particular issue. So, um, I'm I'm going to shy away from that one right now because I think it's a very long and complicated how does the church, how are they involved with state matters? What does it mean as a citizen of heaven, as a citizen of God, his kingdom, to also be a good citizen of earthly kingdoms, which I may or may not agree with things, and yet I need to be a good citizen. I need to be tolerant and some of those things. Another whole issue for another day. And then the last thing, and this is really, I think, taking a lot of of um, energy right now. Um, to be honest, it is really, there's been a lot of press and, and a lot of books are put out right now on the issue of looking at, hey, we need to look at this differently. I, I just highlight one and I'll actually make a, a comment about this later, but it's a book called Bible, Gender, and Sexuality. Uh, and the author is James Brownson. He's, and and these used to come from what we used to say were liberal seminaries or people that wouldn't look at the Bible and say, the miracles really happened, Jesus really rose from the dead, some of those things. And now these are not. They're coming from places where maybe a, a, a little bit towards that, but they would believe in the authority of Scripture. They would believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and on and on. Uh, this 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 man is a, a gentleman is a professor at Western Theological Seminary, which is a a, a good seminary, and 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 yet he w- he promotes the idea that um, throughout Scripture there is actually no um, prohibitions whatsoever regarding um, 
same-sex, long-term, monogamous, loving, um, caring uh, relationships. And again, um, that that is uh, maybe somewhat true in the fact that in, in, in times of Scripture, that was not a commonplace thing. Uh, it was so looked down upon by society. You didn't do this out out in public, and so of course there there was some differences of culture. Um, and however, I'm going to 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 move in uh, and speak against that uh, view, um, primarily because I do think many more and more people are reading things like that, and they're starting to doubt what the what the Bible says. Uh, there was a, another book put out recently. I don't have the author in front of me at the moment. Let me see if I can really quick find it. I just looked it up just a moment ago. I, I have not read this one um, recently. Um, it is by this is in a, a this is a actually a uh, journal article, um, and it's a man a man by the name of Robert. I'm not sure how to say his last name, and I I, do, I just don't know the gentleman, but uh, Ganuse G N U S E, and it's seven gay texts biblical passage used to condemn homosexuality. And in that, he basically says, listen, there are seven primary texts that condemn homosexuality, allegedly. And he, he'll just go through all seven and show that absolutely none of them are referring to free, adult, loving, same-sex uh, individuals. And he, he just goes through a variety of other things uh, that they're going through the the passage that we were looking at in Romans chapter one and twenty uh, one twenty six and twenty seven. His argument is basically: look at this is in the context of idolatry, and what the apostle Paul is talking about is any kind of sexual immorality and any kind of homosexuality that would happen as part of a pagan cult um, regarding uh, what would happen in a in a some type of uh, he would call it the ISIS cult in Rome. So I mean those things are out there and 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 again the the thing like we had said is is that's not what Paul's main point is his main point is not idolatry in and and the kind where you bow down before an idol it's idolatry where you're exchanging creation creator for creation and we are shunning the ways of God the the natural things that he created and we're doing things on our own and we're looking to the same A very very different argument the way he would look at it. So, and again, this podcast is not primarily about um, trying to refute all those different things, but I, I just want you to be aware of the loudness and it's loud, right? Coupled with the loudness is the fact that that we tend not to want to talk about this. Again, it's, it's, it's embarrassing or maybe it shows us weak or it goes beyond just talking about the weather or sports or whatever. And, um, and so I really want to encourage you with, with two books. These books have really uh, been a blessing to me as, a, as I've worked through my, my own uh, personal journey uh, in my own sexuality. And we all have a journey in sexuality, right? Um, one of the things you're going to hear me say is that we're all broken in our sexuality. Whether you're wherever you're at on any of these things, none of us has a, a perfect sexuality. And so just trying to understand people from different perspectives or um, whatever. And the, the books that I'm going to recommend is one by uh, the uh, Dr. Wesley Hill. Uh, Dr. Wesley Hill is a uh, the Associate Professor of New Testament at Trinity School for Ministry um, in the Anglican tradition. Uh, that's based out of uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I've had the opportunity to have Wesley at our church. I uh, did a conference for us. Wesley is a is a very uh, good good speaker, a very good man, very devout uh, follower of Jesus Christ. His book is called Washed in Waiting. If I were to reflection on Christian faithfulness and homosexuality, if I were to recommend just one book to you, that would be this one. And it, it, it regardless of where you're at on anything, just his openness creates the conversation piece, which is so great. The other one I'd really recommend is a book called Homosexuality and the Christian by Mark Yarhouse. That's Y-A-R-H-O-U-S-E. He's a professor at Wheaton College. He's a clinical psychologist who primarily has entered into sexual and gender identity issues, transgenderism, uh, uh, some of the other things that are going on currently, uh, and how, how to respond to that from a caring compassionate, loving, humble, 
and yet biblical way of looking at things. And so I thought that's a rare combination. But trust me, there's a lot of finger pointing. There's a lot of yelling. Uh, there's a lot of name calling. And uh, um, boy, I, if you're hearing me do any of that in this, I, 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 that's not my aim. My aim is to really help move along. So here's what I want to do in the in and what we're going to do. And I, 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 if you're if you're unaware, this podcast is going to go longer. I'm aiming for about an hour, but we'll see. Um, I want to talk about what sex is all about, and I'm not actually going to look directly at the issue of homosexuality. I'm just going to look at the issue of what sex or what what was God thinking about this whole thing. And then I'm going to go, then, okay, then with that, uh, what's going on in the analogy uh, of, of what God's trying to accomplish in sex? And then I, I want to basically give some hope, both biblically and just some, just some words that I just want to share with you um, from that, and then talk about what does it look like to, instead of just being kind of sucked into the some of the narratives or or some of the uh, scripts that people are hearing to maybe rethink that script a bit. And uh, and then I just want to give it as an invitation uh, for for us to just kind of kind of move forward in this conversation, really just an open conversation. So um, Hopefully there's someone in your life that you can talk to about these things, whether or not it's a struggle that you might be having or you know someone or you're just struggling with the issue in general, that, w- that we can have a conversation and start to actually think about things. So with that said, I want to start out by looking at what was God thinking about when he created sex? And it's, it's very important that we look at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, where God actually creates sex, Okay. And if you look at this, it's in Genesis chapter 2, so it's the second chapter of the Bible, and it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So what's happening here is God looks at something in creation and he says it's not good. It's not morally wrong. Uh, sin has not yet entered the world, if you know your Bible. That happens in Genesis chapter 3. But in Genesis chapter 2, something isn't finished yet. So what does that mean? Well, he's going to finish it. And how does he do it? He goes about it a very unique way because God is a master teacher. God knows that Adam's alone and it's not good for him to be alone, but Adam doesn't really understand it. There's all these animals, these birds, it's all this stuff. And what do they do? Well, they bring them all to the man. He names them. And in that, he gets up close and personal. And if you look at the end of verse 20 in chapter two, it says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. In other words, they were looking for a helper and, 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 and God knew that he was alone, but now Adam realizes he's alone and it hits him. The passage goes on, verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So you see what's going on here? They're looking for, they're looking for someone suitable. So instead, it's, it's, God creates Eve, but it's the only thing in all of creation that's created out of something already living. It's fascinating. Takes it out of out of his side, the rib. That's that 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 can be a translation being he had taken from his side, and he brings her to the man. And the man first says, "This is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh." But I'm not going to call her Adam number two. And in other words, there's something different about her. She shall be called woman. So there's a ton of similarity, but there's a, there's some difference here. She was for she was taken out of man, and then it says this. This is why that is why a man leaves his mother and father, and he and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now the idea of one flesh there means a lot of things. It implies a lot of intimacy. It implies the answer to the man not being alone, but it also implies sexuality. 
It, it, it certainly is more than that, but it's not less than that. So all of that goes on to say, what was God up to here? He was ending aloneness. He was creating human community. And he was inviting them into something that tastes of intimacy. Now, we're going to come back to this in a minute. Now, if we move on then to one of the most profound passages in the New Testament is from the Apostle Paul. And uh, I'm not going to unpack all of this with you, but I I want you to see something very important. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is teaching about husbands and wives, and he says this. I'm going to pick it up in verse 25. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, I'm just stopped there for a second. So what's he doing? He's saying, husbands, here's the deal. I want you to love your wives. How do you love them? Let me give you an analogy, he says. Here's the analogy. Think about how much Jesus loved the church. And it works out in the Greek language, which the Bible's written in. The, the word for church is a feminine word. Okay, if you're familiar with other languages, they have they can be masculine or feminine in, in the word. And, and ecclesia, the word for church, is a feminine word. And so here it's saying he, he cleanses her, he makes her holy, he washes her, he gave himself up for her. He's talking about the church there. So think of the analogy, he says, in the analogy here, guys, you're, the, you're Christ and you give yourself that way. In other words, you lay down preference, you serve her, you help her, you help her to become like a rose that opens up, to become all that they were created to be. That's your job is to be like Jesus. And Jesus does this, Why? It says, to present to himself a radiant church. In other words, he does all of this in order to really serve himself because he is seeking after a beautiful church in the analogy, okay? He says, that's what's going on here. You are Christ in the analogy. Uh, if you're if you're a man listening to this and you're married, dude, you're not you're not Jesus, okay? And if you're a woman and you're married, you're not the church. We can't make a gift to you and it's tax deductible. That's that's not it's an analogy, right? Keep we're going to go on. It says, in this same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, verse 29, no one ever hated his own body, but they fed and they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And then he quotes from the same verse I just read from Genesis chapter 2. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. A what? What'd you just say? He's saying there's a profound mystery. You, you, you thought I was telling you that the analogy for marriage was actually Christ and the church? Oh, dude, Paul says. No, no, no. Let me explain something to you. Marriage is an analogy to teach you about how much Jesus Christ loves his people. So God creates marriage so that people can see his love for them. However, he says in verse 33, each of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay? Let me let me go one more thing here. Uh, if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to pick it up in the middle of verse 13, where he says this. He says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, and he quotes right back to uh, Genesis chapter 2, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So what's going on here? In, in Corinth, these people had come from pagan backgrounds. They were going to the pagan temples. They were hiring a prostitute. And they just said, hey, listen, uh, what we do in the body doesn't matter because it's only our spirit that matters with God. So we're going to do whatever we want. 
um, drug, sex, and rock and roll with our bodies, but we'll, in our spirit, worship God. And it's very interesting that Paul doesn't just scream at them, but he basically says, don't you know that, 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 that that's not who you are anymore? Listen to how he finishes this. Verse 18, he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is the gospel answer, right? You're first and foremost God's because of what Christ has done. He's changed you. The Holy Spirit resides in you, in your body, your physical body. And then he uses this very interesting language where he says, flee from porneia or sexual immorality. And porneia is a big garbage word for all kinds of sexual sin. It's not any, it's where we get pornography from, but it means way more than that. It could mean uh, fornication. It could be adultery. It could be all, all kinds of different things, right? Just even lust in your heart is an idea of porneia uh, in some places. It can at least be uh, alluded to by that. Then he says this, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Now, that's fascinating. Is there something worse about sexual sin? No. But he does say that because of what sexuality is actually trying to do, and I'll get to the overall definition here in a minute, is there something that God is teaching us about the way it was created, that when we sin sexually... It, it often just leaves us feeling more, uh, more empty than when we began. We sin against our own body. Let me give you an example. And, and again, I, I hope you have uh, realized that this is a podcast on sexuality. And so um, it might be a little, little graphic, but let me just go ahead and do this. Let's just say um, one of the porneas is masturbation. One of the things that we, um, not in the way God's designing things, but it's a thing, uh, we all struggle with, right? People struggle with, with uh, over a period of time and it's self being alone and having sex by yourself, so to speak, reaching orgasm through stimulation. Okay. And, and, but, but the goal of sexuality, we already talked about this was to end aloneness and to create intimacy. And so, so, um, what happens then is you actually feel more alone afterwards. Yes, you, you achieved sexual orgasm or climax and that felt a certain sense of goodness, but by the fact that you were alone and you weren't with someone and really consummating the idea of what sexuality is supposed to really be in this safe, covenanted, caring, lifelong relationship, therefore you it, it's lost, right? And so the sin is is it's really that says you sin against their own body. It it leaves you feeling the way it wasn't supposed to be. So with just those three passages, and there's more, but those are the big ones. Let's come to a definition. What is sexuality, or what I like to call gospel sexuality? Because I think the gospel sexual ethic is 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 very high, right? Um, God created sex to end aloneness, to create exclusive human community. Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse four: Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. And so that that doesn't just mean uh, away from adultery, away from pornography, secret sex lives, and all that. It also means that that I am not using my spouse just for my personal pleasure. I am not using her, as John Piper has said very effectively. I'm not using my wife as a mannequin for masturbation. And I know that's extremely graphic, and I apologize if it is, but it's actually very helpful to think. That's what the standard of gospel sexuality is. It's very high. So, I mean, I, I, I deeply wrestle with making sure that my sexuality is is in line with what God would have. So God created sex to end aloneness, to create exclusive human community, and to scream to us our desire for intimacy. But here's the big point. All of that is just an illustration of his relationship with us. You don't have to be sexual. You don't have to be married. You you can be single all your life and be able to, to look at this illustration and realize God's love for you. It It's like I say, Paul and Jesus are my two heroes, biggest heroes, and there's other ones. Peter, I like Peter. He's a good guy. Uh, he's married, and, and the Apostle John, we, we think he was married. They're, they're great guys. To me, the big heroes of the New Testament are Pete, Jesus, of course. You know, <laughs> I vote Jesus every day, all, all twice on Sundays, right? But 
and the Apostle Paul, single guys, celibate, single guys. So that's the point. And so we most certainly don't just pick on or one particular uh, issue, say homosexuality or transgenderism or anything like that, and say that uh, you don't meet the biblical standard and I do because I'm straight or I'm cisgendered or whatever. It's, it's much more important for me to say, listen, everybody's sexuality is broken. We're all in this together. We need to have open and honest conversations. My struggles are not going to be your struggles. No one's going to be identical. We're in this together in community. With that, I want to read from Wesley Hill's book, and I want to read the introduction. To me, this is profound. And it's actually, I'm not going to read the whole introduction, but I want to read um, actually the very start of when he wrote this book. And I I hope it whets your appetite. I, I highly recommend this book to you. Again, Washed and Waiting. Let me, let me read a couple paragraphs to you. He says this. By the time I started high school, two things had become clear to me. One, that I was a Christian. My parents had raised me to be a believer in Jesus, and as I moved toward independence from my family, I knew that I wanted to remain one, that I wanted to trust, love, and obey Christ, who had been crucified and raised from the dead for us and for our salvation, as the creed puts it. The second thing was that I was gay. For as long as I could remember, I had been drawn, even as a child, to other males in some vaguely confusing way. And after puberty, I had come to realize that I had a steady, strong, unremittent, unremitting, exclusive sexual attraction to people of the same sex. Since that time of self-discovery, I have struggled week in and week out to know how to live faithfully as a Christian who experiences same-sex attraction. In the most difficult hours of that struggle, I have looked for articles or books to help me. I have searched for things written in the, f- in the furnace, so to speak, by other gay Christians, books born out of intense personal wrestling with homosexuality, as well as with the demands of the gospel that I could look to for guidance. I have found dozens, maybe hundreds of scholarly articles and monographs debating the passages in the Bible that deal with homosexuality. Journals and encyclopedias gave me countless studies of the psychosomatic, social, and possible genetic origins of homosexualities. Books of history and sociology detailed the ways various cultures and time periods have described and dealt with people who experience sexual desires for others, sexual desire for others of the same sex. But I've never found a book I could resonate with that tries to put into words some of the confusion and sorrow and triumph and grief and joy of the struggle to live faithfully before God in Christ with others as a gay person. This is my attempt to write such a book. So he, he, uh, I just think that's just a profound beginning to this book. He goes on later in the introduction to say this. So this book is neither about how to live faithfully as a practicing homosexual, nor about how to live faithfully as a fully healed or former gay man or woman. And he he describes his own journey. He goes into detail later on in the book about his own journey where he had experienced, could I be faithful as a a follower of Jesus? And I'm committed to that. And could I then live out this same sex sex, uh, sexuality? Uh, And he said, no, it's not consistent. And the other thing he says is, you know, can I just, can I pray? And, and some would maybe crassly say, pray the gay away. And he says, it hasn't gone away for me. And, and I, I would say that in my, like I mentioned, uh, 34 years of, of almost 34 years of being in ministry professionally, there I have seen uh, men who have seen some miraculous change in that. But I've also seen a lot who haven't. And uh, so he's saying, I, I'm, I'm hoping that that may happen, Lord, but at the same time, I am not. And he goes on to say this. He says, J.I. Packer, commenting on Paul's hopeful word for sexual sinners in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, which I just read, with some of the Corinthian Christians, Paul was celebrating the moral empowering of the Holy Spirit in heterosexual terms with others of the Corinthians Today's homosexuals are called to prove, live out, and celebrate the moral empowering of the Holy Spirit in homosexual terms. This book is about what it means to do that. 
how practicing, excuse me, how practically a non-practicing but still desiring gay Christian can prove, live out, and celebrate the grace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in homosexual terms. Let me just tell you that I, I found his, uh, when I read Washed and Waiting, and as we had Wesley Hill come in and speak to our uh, church planters, uh, our group of church planters at Hope Community, um, I felt the most hopeful I have ever felt about um, helping folks deal with not only homosexuality, but any sexual sin. And the big thing that he goes in is the name of the book, which is called Washed and Waiting. It's based out of a a passage that the Apostle Paul wrote, where it just basically says, but that's who you were. You have been washed, and you're waiting for the, for the coming of the Lord. I'm paraphrasing uh, two different sections of the Apostle Paul. But the idea is that's who you were. You were these things, but that's not your full identity. Your full identity is in Christ. And so I highly recommend uh, this book to you uh, as a way to interact, to think, you know, and to open the conversation even with your own heart, and maybe you're not ready to speak to others about maybe what you're going through or what you're struggling through as you've uh, maybe talked to some folks who who maybe view this differently or whatever, and you're kind of going through some thinking on those things. Let me give you some takeaways here before I move into the scripts. I think there's uh, a lot of takeaways we've already just said. Let me kind of summarize them. The, the boombox of religion, or what I would call legalism, and the boombox of irreligion, the world or whatever, let's just be straight. They're loud. They're every day. They are constantly grabbing for my attention. So let's just acknowledge that. Secondly, God's word is what we need to hear, is what the follower of Jesus is ultimately supposed to, that's supposed to be the very basis of who they are, of what they believe, what they think, how they react, what we do. We need to stay deeply into the, to the word. If we're going to be uh, followers of God, we have to be followers of his word. The definition of sin Number three here, takeaway, is is defined as exchanging creator for creation. And we can do this in a variety of things. It's not just sexuality. But in our sexuality, we do that as well. God, I'll follow you in every area, but not my sexuality. Uh, no, God, I give you my sexuality. All of it. It's a it's, it's broken mess, but I, I give it to you. Third thing, this is huge. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has sinned. All of us have a fallen, broken sexuality. Because of the fall of humanity, we all do not see this clearly. Therefore, we need others around us. We need the scripture to teach us. We need to talk openly about others and let them into our lives because every one of us has sinned. And the answer to sin is not try harder the answer to sin is a savior and to trust Jesus Christ. I'm not, I'm not asking you to get cleaned up so that you can take a bath. I'm saying come to Jesus Christ. He will take care of you. But, and also, therefore, I am not allowed to look down on anyone else. If, if you really don't like people who are fill-in-the-blank, sexual, homosexuality, trans, uh, queer, uh, whatever you have, might have be going on here, uh, then you've got to stop and go, whoa, you don't really understand, first of all, that your own sexuality is broken, just as broken, and that you're acting out in different ways than they are. And many of ours might be more acceptable, quote unquote, but it's still not the way God designed. With that said, though, a takeaway as clear is that homosexual behavior is not God's design. It's, it's unnatural in the sense that it ignores the otherness that God is trying to communicate with the other gender to communicate our relationship with him in the illustration of the gift of sex. There, it's an illustration here of what's happening, and therefore it is not God's design. However, with that said, homosexual behavior is no worse or better than any other sexual sin or any other sin. 
Paul could have used any of those other sins to talk about the difference between natural and unnatural. He doesn't. He chooses homosexuality because it's so clear of going to the same. Homosexual temptation, that that sense that you feel an orientation or you're susceptible to the sin, using biblical language here, that is a temptation. It is no worse or better than any other temptation. And in and of itself, hear this loud and clear, is not sinful. If you have had thoughts like, I think I might have some same-sex attraction, and of course there's a spectrum of how strong that temptation is, that in and of itself is not sinful. It's not worse or better. We, We tend to go inward and shameful and keep it to ourselves and don't talk about it, but it's very important to realize it's temptation. It's temptation. Jesus himself was tempted. Uh, in, our, in our church right now, we're going through the book of Hebrews, and it's a beautiful thing, but in, in, in Hebrews, chapter, um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Dude, whatever you're struggling with, Christ has faced a similar type temptation. Can I say he had exactly... Uh, that same temptation? I, I don't know. I mean, if you're tempted with internet porn, I know that Jesus was never tempted with internet porn. But was he tempted with lust? Yes. Was he tempted with same-sex attraction? Probably, probably all this stuff, right? Were temptations for him. Certainly sexual sin was was a temptation for him, and yet he never sinned. In other words, he withheld it to the maximum without ever giving into it, ever. He never sinned. So he identifies with you. He knows it. He's with you in this. You're not alone. Even if there's no human being you can speak to, the Lord Jesus Christ has been through the deep struggles that you've been through as a human, being fully God and fully man. Number six, takeaways. I think I got I think I'm on six. I lost my track of numbers here. But anyway, for the heterosexual, the straight person, and the homosexual, the answer is exactly the same. The gospel of Jesus Christ for grace. We all need the same thing. And it's very important that our identity as Christians is not in our sexual orientation, our how how pure our sexual lives are. Uh, they're not in whether or not we struggled with something that we're ashamed of or not. But ultimately, our identity as Christians is in being washed by Jesus Christ. He's the one who took care of us. Now, last thing I kind of want to go through here is is I've heard once as I was in uh, um, speech class in high school, it's very important how you frame the issue, right, and how you think about things. And so I want to read a little bit here from um, uh, Mark Yarhouse's book, Homosexuality and the Christian, a guide for parents, pastors, and friends. And what he's going to do in this is he's going to talk about, you, you have this experience and you say you have a young person, and, and I'll let Mark, uh, his, from his words, uh, describe this. But you're going to hear two very different messages. Let me, let me just read from the book and you'll see what I'm getting at here. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, found in the book, Homosexuality and the Christian. Let's imagine a 16-year-old named Chris. He experiences same-sex attraction and is looking for resources to inform him about who he is and what his experiences are all about. Let's imagine that Chris is like an actor on a stage. He's looking for instructions or guidance on how to relate to the audience. Chris is looking for a script. When it comes to treating the experience of same-sex attractions as one and the same as having a gay identity, much of the gay community is ready to hand Chris a gay script. Here's what I think that script looks like. First, uh, he has bullet points. There's four of them. Same-sex attractions signal a naturally occurring or intended by God, in quotes, distinction between homosexuality, heterosexuality, and bisexuality, which would mean you're attracted to both men and women. Number two, same-sex attractions are the way you you know who you, quote-unquote, really are as a person, with an emphasis on discovery. Number three, same-sex attractions are at the core of who you are as a person. Number four, same-sex behavior is the extension of that core. Self-actualization, behavior that matches who you really are, 
this self-actualization is of your sexual identity is crucial for your fulfillment. Okay, so he says that's basically the script, those four things. I'm going to keep going on here. This is a compelling script. The confusing attractions that Chris experiences are seen as natural and intended and blessed by God, placing a great emphasis on the sexual diversity seen in nature. They give way to discovery. They allow Chris to learn about who he really is. The attractions are central to his sense of himself as a person. This script tells Chris that no one can question or judge his behavior because same-sex behavior is merely an expression of his central identity. Finally, in our culture today, a culture that emphasizes, American culture particularly, self-actualizations, which means a realizations of a person's potential, is the highest thing, and is saturated in messages about the pleasures of sex, Chris receives the message that he has every right to act according to his sexual identity. Now, Maybe there's another way to look at this, another way to frame the issue, another script. Here's He goes on to say this. Let's talk about perhaps the way, not legalism, not religion, not somebody looking down your noses, but, but a kind of a scriptural, a biblical, a gospel way of looking at it. Is there another script? And here's what Mark Yarhouse says. He says, in another set of studies, we compared Christians who adopted a gay identity label to Christians who choose not to adopt a gay identity label. Both groups experienced same-sex attraction. Both groups identified themselves as Christians. We found that both groups were interested in living in a way that was consistent with their beliefs and values, but they had two very different ways of doing this. The Christians who adopted a gay identity, and by gay identity, he means everything you believe in those four things, that it's natural, this is the way God designed it, all those kind of things. I know that that phrase can be used differently. In fact, not to get too confusing, but Wesley Hill uses it in a little bit. He uses the word just to say, this is my, the way I um, feel compelled uh, uh, without any effort. This is just my you know, natural way of, I've, I'm, I tend to be towards same sex. But, but Mari Arhaus and gay identity is following that script. Okay, the Christians who adopted a gay identity made their beliefs and values line up with their identity and behavior. In other words, identity and behavior came first, and their beliefs and values had to be adjusted to them. On the other hand, the Christians who did not adopt a gay identity made their identity and behavior line up with their beliefs and values. For this, groups, for this group, beliefs and and values came first. The Christians who adopted a gay identity talked about worshiping God as gay Christians, that doing so was what it meant to be authentic before God. In contrast, the Christians who did not adopt a gay identity indicated that authenticity meant worshiping God on God's terms. Worshiping God out of a gay identity would not reflect true authenticity to them, the message that, that has emerged from these studies is that of another script, and there may be others, he says. It is essentially an identity in Christ script. In other words, I, a person would say, I am a, uh, my identity is as a Christian who struggles with, and you fill in all the temptations we struggle with. So you could call yourself, of course, a gay Christian, but you would say so in a way that would mean, that is one of my, that is my struggle. That is my temptation, okay? Whereas a, another person might use that term, gay Christian, say, I'm totally okay with it. I believe, you know, I'm, I'm buying into the, some of the, the interpretations, interpretations of Scripture that say it's okay. It is essentially an identity in Christ script that stands in sharp contrast to the gay script. Now, here are the script's basic points, and he's going to give these, and this time there are five, okay? Here we go. Here are the five. Number one. Same-sex attraction does not signal a categorical distinction among types of people or persons, but is one of many human experiences that are not the way it's supposed to be. Okay? Number two, same-sex attractions may be part of your experience, but they are not the defining element of your identity. Number three, you can choose to integrate your experiences of attraction to the same sex into a gay identity. But number four says, on the other hand, you can choose to center your identity around other aspects of your experience, including your biological sex or gender identity and so on. Number five, the most compelling aspect of personhood for the Christian is one's identity in Christ. 
a central and defining aspect of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He goes on to, he concludes with this. This script relies on the metaphor of integration rather than discovery. But remember that the discovery metaphor assumes that their attractions tell us who the person, quote unquote, really is. The integration metaphor, on the other hand, begins with the description of the attractions to the same sex and then recognize that, it, that a young person has choices to make about both behavior and identity. The young person can integrate his or her attractions into a gay identity or not. It's two different scripts. They're both struggling with the exact same thing. But one is starting, the starting point is Jesus Christ and what he says. And the other one, the starting point is this is my experiences. And so therefore, it, it must be okay. And I would just go to argue that that's not just this. We could choose anything and it would lead us down a path, perhaps not the way that God would have for us. Now, let me just briefly go into an issue that a lot of people are wrestling with now. And there was a lot of, lot of talk about this. And that is, can a person change their sexual identity? And I'm going to answer by experience and study and conversation with many people, maybe. But it's not anything. It is a gift if it happens. In other words, in the biblical model, you are a follower of Jesus, and yet your flesh is struggling with, with temptation. Will that temptation ever subside in your life or not? Maybe. Most men that I know that struggle with uh, pornography wrestle with the issues of sexuality and viewing it not the way God designed, but as more of a um, conquering of something or as a voyeuristic look uh, or, or all of those things. And they will, they may gain, they may gain, um, they may gain victory over their behavior, and at times the temptation may subside. And there are there are some who say, "I, you know what? I've even given it a thought in five years." However, if I were to to say that that God will just take it away, you can pray the gay away; it'll go away. No big deal. Just stop doing this. Stop being gay. You don't have to be gay. Be something else. I want to be real in that. And, and what I want to do is I want to read from the Apostle Paul here as, as we kind of close our time. And the Apostle Paul does a beautiful thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I, I just love 2 Corinthians because you see Paul's heart and you see it so broken and so hurt by what has happened in his life. Not only the suffering he's gone through, but the way that people have backstabbed him and different things in his ministry have really gone Difficult, but not only that, but there's something deeply in his life that he struggles with. And you know what the beautiful thing is? He never tells us what it is. He calls it a thorn is in his flesh. And I think the reason that he calls it a thorn in his flesh, and whether whether God just knew that and, and made him call it that or whatever, is because we will just insert whatever it is that we struggle with and put it right in there. So we don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I, I don't know. I, I did have after church a guy come down front and tell me, I know what the Apostle Paul's thorn in his flesh was. I know that it was internet pornography. And I said, you know, I'm sure it wasn't internet pornography. <laughs> it might have been lust. It might have been same-sex attraction. It might have been um, a, a longing to be married. It might have been anger. It might have been extreme bitterness. Um, I don't know. It might have been a, a physical ailment. We don't know. And let me close with this because this is the normal Christian life. Second Corinthians chapter 12, he says this, to keep me from being conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he, that's the Lord, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. Let me just give that to you as an encouragement. That I think in the Christian life, what we try to do is we try to make our lives better and easier so that we think then we're representing God more. We think that, God, you can just show yourself in me if I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise, and, and fat, and happy, right? And, and God often says, you know, it might be through scarcity that I'm going to bless you. It might be through difficulty. It, it might be through some pretty extreme temptation that I'm allowing you to continually seek me. It might be through same-sex attraction. That I'm just saying, I so love you and I so want your heart that I'm giving you this, this thing. I'm, I'm helping it. I'm, I'm not taking it away. And the reason I'm not taking it away is because I deeply love you and I want you to follow me. And I know that if I remove this, you wouldn't come after me as hard as you are. So I'm going to leave it. It's not because God doesn't love you. He deeply loves you. He deeply wants a relationship with you. And so he is moving in such a way in your life so that you can say like the apostle Paul, that I will boast in my weaknesses. And I want you to hear this one more time. God saying to you, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. I want to thank you for hanging out with me in this bonus episode of Romans Untangled. If you're interested in the book of Romans, I encourage you to take part in the podcast. Um, If you are feeling like you are suffering silently on this, drop me an email, steve at hopecc.com. And myself or one of the staff at Hope or someone will reach out to you. And especially if you're locally and you belong to Hope, or, or one of our other congregations uh, around the Twin Cities through our church planting network, or, or, or whatever, we would love to connect with you, or at least connect you with someone to help break the silence and to help you to begin talking about these things. May God bless you. May God's grace be sufficient to us, and his power may be perfect to us in our weakness. Amen.